Let's pray. Jesus, we hear in this reading today from Mark that you are being tough. You're tough. We've seen that before, but we see it as you are very tough on this specific issue. Help us today to understand what you're teaching about purity. Help us as we continue to to battle through a culture that is trying to strive for cleanliness and healing, Lord, and seeking out your purity. We, We pray for that right now, that you would help us to see what we can learn from this, what we can take from this, How does it help us to live uh, trusting that you are the one who provides true purity? In Jesus' name, amen. One thing I love about the author that I study every week who helps me uh, process through each reading is that he often just sticks to how does the Old Testament connect to the New Testament. A lot of this reading today creates some confusion and and things we don't understand. They, They don't connect with us. They don't relate to our current culture, and so we have questions. We also see parts of it where Mark is doing what Mark doesn't do. He's providing details, specific details about how the Pharisees responded in purity and how they lived their lives out in in cleanliness and purity, and he's describing all that. But the author that I listened to this week could not avoid how much it connects to our culture today how much it relates to our concern with cleanliness and, and how to respond to one another uh, and what that, how that connection could, could relate back to what the Pharisees ha- had spoken and, and what does it teach us today about living as clean and pure. And so there it seemed fit, very fitting for us to just dive into it, into that, that depth of, of asking those questions of what does that mean about purity today? What does it mean about cleanliness? How, how, how do we stay pure and clean and, and protect ourselves and, and others? How do we do that? What, what, what can Jesus be teaching us about that? The reading opens like this. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of the disciples ate with the hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly holding to the tradition of elders, and when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of elders, but with defiled hands? Why do the Pharisees care about cleanliness and purity? Now let's be clear, it's, it's not for the same reason that we care about washing hands. It isn't about them so worried about passing the diseases back and forth or concerns about viruses. Those were just kind of, of parts of who their society was. But the part of cleanliness for them was, was understanding and striving for purity. The Pharisees were known to go above and beyond. They were, they were trying to, to bring purity and holiness into their lives and be a model example for their community of what that looks like. There's nothing really wrong essentially with that because they are leading the church and so therefore leading and guiding in, in purity and truth, it's all throughout the words that they were speaking and so leading that example was important. Where it crossed the line is where they created their traditions of their own and where it became so strong in their lives that it potentially could harm or hurt others. They had learned about holiness in all sorts of ways in places that were very important in doing sacraments and the holy of holies and and expectations that God had. And so therefore, there were great and honorable and amazing parts of that It's just, where did it blend with their traditions? And these are the questions that will come out in this. This still can be hard for us to understand, even with that explanation of them and and their passion for purity because we've moved on now that, that Jesus has died and rose again. The differences of sacrifices and holy of holies and, and, and purity in itself is kind of gone. But we haven't moved on from purity moments. I mentioned this name before, and it was very important in the 90s. In the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there became a new understanding of a sexual revolution and and all of these new uh, ideas that were coming out. It changed in the way people responded, 
And the church felt like they had to respond to it. And so they did in many and different ways. And one of those people was, his name was Joshua Harris. And he came out strong with with deciding how to live and teach young people purity. If this understanding of protecting marriage and the sexual relationship was so important, then he wanted to come away to help young people do that. He decided to do it through a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye, and it was his attempt and goal to help young people protect their purity as described in the purity moment in, in the in purity movement in the 90s and that was his goal it, it was well intentioned it was it, it, he had a thought process behind it to help protect this sacred thing called marriage a sacred blessing he wanted kids to be able to to celebrate it in a in a amazing way in the way that God intended it and that was an honorable thing for him to think about and he had the best of intentions The challenge with teenagers is that they are uh, in a state and a place where things can shape them. So even if they were influenced by, by the culture and how they viewed sex, they still had the challenge of responding now in an anti-cultural way. And while the church, that is something that, that was uh, not shocking that the church would do, it went, now went a step further to, to not even engage in relationships until you were so serious that you absolutely knew that you were going to marry that person. It created a, something that I would like to say are like fences. How do we use fences in the church? If you go around Mount Calvary, you'll notice in our wonderful land that the Lord has blessed us with that we don't have a fence of our own. Many of our neighbors have fences, but we don't have a fence for us to protect our land or to protect the the blessing that God has given us with a fence. We don't line it off or say, don't come in. It's a very understanding of the church that we would want people to come in, not keep people out. And a fence essentially speaks, we are going to keep people out. And so when we look at, at the fences that could potentially be created by the church, they're not physical fences that we can see. Honestly, they're invisible fences. What are invisible fences? Invisible fences are, are the traditions of men. They are rules that men and people set up to protect certain truths that they find important in the church. Therefore, Joshua Harris sees a truth like, I want to protect the the sacredness and sanctity of marriage. I want to teach youth how to do that. And so therefore, I'll put up this invisible fence to create rules, even on top of what's in Scripture, so to make sure that this specific important rule, this important sanctity, this important truth is taken care of. And I'll create more rules, more things, even than there are in Scripture, more fences, more invisible fences, so that, so that this is protected. This is where we can now come back to what did the Pharisees do? The Pharisees had invisible fences that had become a place of judgment. They were so worried about protecting purity and holiness and sacrifices and how they handled themselves that they created all of these rules, all of these traditions of themselves to make sure that they were holy and pure. They knew that they were impure and that there was sinful people and that there needed to be sacrifices done. And so they looked to go on top of that to say, how else can we create purity so it's in our lives, not just in this sacrificial way, but also in all of our lives. So if we go to the marketplace and we touch a sinful person, we want to come back and wash our hands and our pots and, and our couches and anything that that sinful person could have touched. So we protect the purity that God has given us through his sacrifices to forgive us, and these people who are sinful still, who haven't confessed that, they haven't admitted to those sins, we're not gonna, we don't want to touch them because it will defile us, and therefore the Pharisees then want to ask about the disciples. They want to question the disciples, they, they want to the challenge who the disciples are, because of course, Jesus, the followers of Jesus, shouldn't they be even more pure? Wouldn't they be even more on top of the rules of keeping purity? Because this is so important for them to be 
sinless, to not have sin, that they have all these sacrifices and all these expectations and all these understandings of what God has laid before them of how to confess and receive the forgiveness of God, that wouldn't they want to make sure that they are staying far away from the sinful people? They have created these invisible fences of how they take care of that by washing their hands and, 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 and essentially pushing people out who are sinful. See how Jesus responds to this. Jesus doesn't waste any time. Sometimes we can see Jesus in some ways being a little more gentle, but he is not gentle in this case. This is kind of the theme of Mark, but even more, Mark 7 stands so strong about where Jesus is on this issue. He doesn't mess around. He doesn't waste any time. He dives right into words that they had heard spoken before. And he said to them, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written this people honors me with their lips but their heart is far from me in vain do they worship me teaching a doctrines of the the commandments of men you leave the commandment of god and hold to the tradition of man you see jesus digs into parts of them in all of this he calls them hypocrites he tells them that they're people who speak the truth with their lips, but then deny them by their actions. And then he calls them to the ultimate punishment, death. That they would die because of this. And they knew these words. These words were spoken by the prophet Isaiah, and they had heard them spoken before. They had spoke them to people themselves. The reading says today that, that goes back to what Jesus is referring to. We heard it read this morning. And the Lord said, because of the people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me, and, they fear the, and their fear of me is a commandment taught by men, therefore, behold, I will again do wonderful things with this people, with wonder upon wonder, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men shall be hidden. They hear the ultimate sentence of death. But not just death in this life, that they would eventually die and no longer live, but their platform will die. The place that has risen up where they stand and speak that truth to people, it will die before them and they will no longer be the ones that people come to to seek out wisdom. All this purity that they are explaining and lifting themselves up on this high platform to say they are the ones that are pure will go away. They spoke these words. They spoke these words to people. Never ever believing that it was them that, that, that the Isaiah that was prophesying about. Never ever believing that they would lose who they are. And they're challenged in it. And they didn't even see it coming. Joshua Harris reflects back on a moment as he was in the midst of explaining this purity to teenagers. His book had sold a million copies. He had a church that was growing, and he was so thrilled with where he was, but yet he had an understanding that his church was humble. And he sat down with another author that was popular at that time, an author I loved called Donald Miller, and he sat down for coffee with Donald, and he just told him, how amazing his church was and he was so excited about what God was doing and he kept talking about how humble his church was and Donald in a gentle way just looked back at him and said it's very interesting that your church is so aware of your humbleness not usually are our humble churches aware of the of of of, the, of their humbleness like your church is it didn't sink in until later. The challenge that was sitting on Joshua Harris's heart of by his striving to, to help protect the, the sacredness of marriage and by believing that that was the humble way to approach things, he was lifting himself up on a platform. He was lifting himself up even in by calling himself and his church humble to say that they had humility, that it was part of who they were and their culture. 
And we see that Jesus goes on further as he looks at the Pharisees in the midst of this moment, in the midst of them lifting themselves up in this purity, lifting themselves up to say, look at us, we're so pure. How come your disciples aren't pure? And Jesus goes on even further. He said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God in order to establish your tradition." For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles the father or the mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother. Thus making void the word of God to your tradition that you have handed down and many such things to do. Here he is showing them the conflict that happens. He is talking about the laws that they knew from Moses that they referred to and referred before that the passed down by the elders, that they were keeping the traditions of the elders. Jesus goes back and responds that they're the traditions of men. That some of these traditions that you are claiming are from God or elders or prophets that you speak that I said had been passed down are not. They are from men. And so he's showing them how that's done. Now, in order to understand what Jesus is doing here, we have to understand a word that we probably just gloss over. It's easy to do when we're reading Scripture. We hit a word we don't know. How do we figure it out? Where do we research it? Where can we go into it? And korban is that word for us. We're like, what, is, what does this mean? What possibly is Jesus referring to? Korban is a gift or an offering. And in order to understand what happened with a gift or an offering at that time, it's different than our gifts or our offerings here. But once something was given, once something was committed to be given, maybe not even given yet, so it could be land that they had promised that they would give to the church, they would, they would give in that way, it could have been in that way. They said, this is, this is Korban, this is a gift that we're giving to the church. And once it was committed that it was the offering to the Lord, it could no longer be used for anything else. So what happened is that down the road, all of a sudden, this, this family had committed to giving their land. They had committed to giving their land away and giving it to the church. And then all of a sudden, their family, their parents got sick. They, they needed to take care of them. They needed to do things for them. They, they, needed, they ran out of the, the money that they had at that time when they committed the gift. And they could no longer take care of their family because the one asset they had was Korban. It was committed to to the gift of the church. And what Jesus is challenging here is he is challenging them. Isn't one of the commandments, honor your father and mother? So no longer can these people honor their father and mother. They can't take care of their father and mother because they've already committed this gift to the Lord. They've already committed this gift to the church. And you hold them to that so tightly that they can't honor a commandment that they've given to him. He is showing them a conflict. And when he shows them that conflict, they come back to words that they know that maybe uh, we know when we, when we think about commandments a little bit, but how deep it is to not honor that commandment, to not, to not fulfill that commandment, it goes back into words in Leviticus. Let's hear these words. For anyone who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or mother. His blood is upon him. Jesus brings out that the Pharisees are causing these people to sin. They are causing these people to potentially have death, that they can't honor their father and mother because they are keeping their traditions that they've promised to the church, they've promised to the Pharisees, they've promised to the leaders of the church the land that they would be given to them. He, he is showing them, you are causing them the ultimate sentence. He is bringing them back to a challenge of what have their invisible fences done? What have their traditions done to people? And here, they want to call out his disciples in the middle of this place. One of the hardest conclusions that Joshua Harris had to come to when he looks back upon the purity movement, he looks back at at what was happening in in the 90s, and his, his 
intention to help care for teenagers and young people and keep the, the sacredness of marriage and that the church valued it and that he wanted to do that was he had to see that some of his rules were creating rules on top of Scripture. They weren't rules in Scripture. He was creating rules on top of Scripture, and people were following them like they were God's Word. They, they were believing that these truths of not dating and, and, and being careful how you respond in relationship, some churches go on to explain that, that, that female and males wouldn't even interact because they were afraid what that relationship would do and would it create an impurity in them by relating to, a, to another person that they were potentially going to marry. What they were missing was grace. What they were missing is the core foundation of Scripture. They were missing that, that Jesus came to a sinful world, a sinful, broken world world with hurting people. All throughout scripture, you can read this all around. People battle with this all the time. Jesus comes to heal people who are who are broken, who culture has cast out, who has has deemed impure. And here the Pharisees are doing the same thing. They are looking even at the disciples who have who have committed their lives to follow Jesus, who are following Jesus and they are challenging them if they're pure enough. Now, in many ways, it has just been better to just stay away from the subject of cleanliness and purity and and not create more rules than what Scripture says. We have a mission and a vision at Mount Calvary, we have a mission and a vision of church, no matter what's going on in the culture around us, to keep moving forward. We've asked our board to handle the business of, of, of how to handle illness and viruses and, and what to do in the midst of this. How do we care for people in both ways? But I can't miss that we have created our own ways of purity. It doesn't matter what side we fall on it, whether we believe that, that, that health and, and, and doctors and all the, the medical advice and wisdom and experts is the way in going purity, or we feel like coming back to protecting our bodies and, and doing everything to take things organically from the ground the way that God intended them is the pure way to go. We are creating more rules, more invisible fences than Scripture speaks about. We, are we wrestling and asking God the questions of, of what did you intend in purity? Instead, we are saying this is the way to be pure, to do all these things that these experts have said over here, or this is the way to be pure, to do all these things on our own, trusting our own wisdom, or seeking out things that, that are untouched by, by men and undoctored and set up and put into practice in that way? Is that the way to go to handle things and, and protect our immunity and do that? And we have created all sorts of conversations again around purity. We moved away from this movement. The whole movement in the 90s, true love waits, is long gone. Our, our concern of where purity is there, we, we don't know what to do anymore. Purity in, in that kind of way is a whole new set of, of conversations and confusion and questions. But now we've moved into a new level of trying to figure out what's the purest way to handle our health. And Jesus answers this simply. This is a sinful, broken, hurting world. There will be illnesses and viruses and people will be battling with sin all the days of their life. They they need grace. They need forgiveness. They need Jesus in their lives to speak that they are forgiven children of God. No matter what way they choose, no matter what way that they feel is the purest way to go, they need that grace. And our culture right now, just look around. We've forgotten it. We've created all sorts of invisible fences and rules and traditions, and we've built those around, and we cast those in judgment, just like the Pharisees, on everybody else who doesn't follow the way that we think is the purest. It's brutal right now. It's painful. 
When I went over these words of Scripture this week and, and I asked Jesus about this, this is a challenging topic that I, I have really, in so many ways, stayed away from for this exact purpose. Everybody's trying to figure out what's the purest way to go. And people are getting sick no matter what. Viruses are, the virus is happening in all sorts of ways, and people are battling it in all sorts of manners. It doesn't mean to not do the best we can with, with the gifts we've been given and, and, and the doctors that God has blessed us with who have great wisdom and, and the people who coach us about health and immunity. All those things are wonderful things to, to search and to ask and to seek out. But to come back to the fact that we're not creating our own rules that cast judgment upon people, that pull away from the very foundation of the church to give grace and forgiveness and teach them this truth. Jesus' blood is true purity. That's it. That's the only place to be truly pure is in the blood of Jesus. He's the grace and forgiveness that the Pharisees were, were seeking out so long to be holy with because they knew that they were sinful people so they had to follow these sacrifices perfectly. And in that time in the 90s when they, it was true love waits and they're trying to figure out the perfect way to be pure in marriage, I teach it to couples all the time. The way you live a pure marriage, a relationship together is to wake up every day forgiving one another. Admitting that you're a sinful human being and asking for that forgiveness from your, from your relationship. And the same thing is true of us now in this culture, in this time. We wake up every day looking at each other in places that we've made mistakes. In places that we've tried to do it on our own. We've tried to create how to be healthiest on our own. And we admit and look and say, in this sinful world full of sickness and illness, we are going to battle this all the days of the Lord. And, and Jesus, we need your grace. We haven't quit praying for a cure for this virus. And the reason we haven't quit praying, because we look to Jesus, the ultimate healer. We look to Jesus who, who can heal, restore, and bring blind people so they can see. People who, could, who, who are paralyzed, that they can walk, who can forgive the sins of people that have been impure in our culture's eyes forever. That's what the church has. That's what Jesus gives us. He gives us his true blood and grace and forgiveness. He gives us true purity. And you, extraordinary servants, God has given you that grace. I pray you hear that today. You hear that promise that you know no matter what you've done, no matter what sins you've committed, you are no, not impure because of the blood of Jesus. He has forgiven and restored you and sent you out again to live in this life. You don't have a, to live a life of fear or shame or questions about who you are because it's Jesus' blood that covers you. And my prayer for us is that we live that out. Man, we need grace right now. Our culture needs grace so badly. I look around and see the hurting people and I just want to give everyone those words. I almost said it. I want to give everyone a hug, but I can't. Because they just need it right now. Jesus wasted no time to call it out and to speak back what is true purity. He came to bring it. His death and resurrection and grace and mercy and love came to bring that forgiveness, that healing, that restoration that we need. And we need it again right now. It's a new purity movement about trying to figure out the purest way to go with our health. And the answer is, as an imperfect, sinful culture, we'll never figure it out. We continue to ask God for wisdom and seek Jesus out and say, Lord, make us pure. Jesus, by your blood and forgive us, make us pure. And help us give that to this world. This hurting, broken, impure world. Purify them. Let's pray. Jesus, we know we have our ways of being pure, clean, and protecting ourselves. 
Help us tear, tear down the judgment fences we have built. Jesus, make your church ready to share about the purity that comes because of your death and resurrection. Help us to be patient, gentle, loving, and forgiving. Amen.